Our speaker is Diane Graves. She is the Assistant Vice President for Information Resources and University Librarian at uh, Trinity University in San Antonio, where she is also the Copyright Officer. Her career includes library administrative positions at Hollins University in Roanoke, Virginia, the University of Mississippi, and at Loyola University in Chicago. Her work has evolved from amassing collections to helping students gain access to traditional and electronic resources that transform learning. In Diane's current position at the Coates Library at Trinity, she focuses on providing services to students and faculty and promoting positive change from the traditional academic library to a more dynamic service and access environment. Central to her interest is balancing user needs against costs, longevity, and preservation in the cultural, of the cultural record. So Trinity's Coates Library was selected by the Association of College and Research Libraries as the recipient of the 2007 Excellence in Academic Libraries Award College Division. In 2009, Diane served as chair of Trinity University's Faculty Senate. Under her leadership, Trinity's faculty was recognized for its willingness to be a leader in reshaping scholarly communication. She shepherded the passage of a resolution in support of open access and that makes scholarly research more re easily accessible to a broader academic community. Trinity was the first small, primarily undergraduate liberal arts institution to pass such a measure. At the time, only Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and the University of Kansas had open access policies. Needless to say, Trinity's faculty received wide acclaim for their leadership. Today, Trinity supports digital publication through its Digital Commons, an institutional repository which hosts scholarships selected and deposited by the individual departments and centers on campus. Diane earned her BA in English and a Master in Librarianship from Emory University. She's been active in the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, serving on its steering committee and EDUCAUSE, where from 2005 to 2009, she served on the faculty of the EDUCAUSE Institute. Let's give Diane a warm welcome. Here we go. I have to razz you all. I, I did a talk about a year ago at Texas A&M, and, and they did the howdy thing. <laughs> it was like, I mean, I, that was a new one for me. So, okay, so can everybody hear me okay? Howdy. Uh, you're not right? <laughs> so, what word was that? Howdy. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so um, we've already introduced myself, and I assume everybody knows where Trinity is. I'm back in Texas. I've done this in other states, and they all think we're in Connecticut, and that's, the, that's little Trinity. We're the big Trinity. <laughs> so, and we, we were the ones that got trinity.edu first, so we, we get to claim it. So, so I, was, uh, I was excited to come to Texas Women's University, and uh, just last week a friend of mine gave me a book called Quotable Texas Women. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have to use a quote from Quotable Texas Women. So I found this one. And so my purpose today is to make you enlightened or a little bit closer to enlightenment than you were before you got up and came in today. So, um, and apparently Sherry McConnell is a Texan. She a, was a big shot Verizon and has done a lot of other cool things. But anyway, so that's my, that's my bit of women's empowerment stuff. So I want to ask a few questions about who is here today. So um, a little demography. How many people in here are scientists? Any scientists? All right. Two scientists? Not many. Okay. Social scientists? All right. Wow. One. Are you an e economist by any chance? Political science. Political science. Well, well, it's too bad we don't have an economist, but we'll pretend that there's one here anyway. Okay. Uh, how about humanists? One? Two? No others? Okay. Goodness. Okay. So, uh, what else is here? <laughs> Librarians? Library people? Okay. A lot of library people. Okay. Good. All right. Good. So, how many of you, of you academic uh, teaching faculty members, how many of you have had to do a part a participate in a significant journals cancellation over the last 20 years? Yeah, I should say. Actually, the librarians can raise their hands here, too. So, right. Um, how many in the last five? Have you done it in the last five? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you like it? <laughs> did you have a good time with it? 
that's a lot of fun. So uh, well, we're going to talk about why you had to go through that. So um, we're going to start off with a little history lesson. Do we have a, do we have a historian in here? No. Okay. All right. So. Um, 1985. How many people remember 1985? <laughs> um, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, and the U.S. dollar was very, very strong at that time, um, and it was creating a significant trade imbalance here in the United States, so U.S. goods and services were having a hard time being sold abroad. So, meanwhile, Europe and the U.K. were home to many of the big for-profit publishing entities many of whom you've heard of. Elsevier, we still wham on, but at that time there were still some other ones kicking around out there before they all consolidated under the, under the Elsevier umbrella. And so we used to hiss about um, Pergamon Press. Anybody remember Pergamon Press? Yes. Or Gordon and Breach? Some of those guys. Okay. Um, so they're all over there in the UK and in the Netherlands primarily. And um, they, were, uh, they were really home to most of the STEM publications. So libraries were using their strong U.S. dollars to purchase those publications, and everything was going okay, and then the Reagan administration decided to devalue the dollar. And so with the stroke of a pen, 1986 subscription prices jumped up 15% overnight. So the next year, we also saw subscription prices jump up another 20 to 25%. All right? So ultimately, this is like the beginning of the story, in this period, 86 to 2011, the consumer price went, index went up 105%. And as Nick told us last night, scholarly journal prices went up 402% in that same amount of time. Okay? So this is what was happening to library budgets along with that. So, um, and I, I mentioned to Nick that, remember how last evening he said because this stuff is Creative Commons, it allows for reuse? I'm reusing. <laughs> um, so you'll see some other slides again that he used last night, but I wanted you to sort of get a sense of this. His was a little bit prettier, but it still shows what's going on. You know, here's the CPI, here's journal prices, and this is book prices down here. And that's, uh, again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more about what that means. So here's where we need economics. You remember we've learned this charge what the market will bear. So what started happening was library budgets did not keep up with those price increases. So faculty and librarians tended to agree that we had to present the core or pr protect the core journals first. So we started cutting lesser known, little used journals or less often used journals. But we were trained, we retained those journals that were increasing price the fastest and the most dramatically because those were the core, right? So those are the ones we want to take care of, all right? So, as Nick pointed out last night, one of the other issues that was going on is this. For most publications, you have a sense of what you're going to pay for, okay? But as he pointed out last night, some of them are very variable. So, um, this one at Trinity cost us $23,000, $110,000 if we had purchased it. We actually deal with Elsevier a little differently, but um, that's what the price was for an institution with fewer than 10,000 students last year. But what I found looking at it is that the price for bigger institution can range anywhere from $27,000 up to, as we heard last night, $36,000 for a single year of tetrahedron. All right? So remember, they're charging what the market will bear. So I assume since Harvard is the one paying $36,000, that they are willing to pay $36,000, right? Okay, so here's what's going on behind that marketplace. Beginning in the late 80s, the, the big European publishing companies started watching and noticing what we in libraries and, and the academy were doing. And they realized that they could continue to raise prices and it would force the little guys out. Then they started looking and saying, okay, here's a small society publication still run by the small society. That one seems to be staying on. They're not canceling that one. What we want to do is buy it. We'll go into that small scholarly society and say, we will take your headaches. Here are those headaches again. We will take your headaches away from us. We will pay you a little bit of money to your organization so, we, so you get some money back for running your journal. We'll take it over. All your headaches are gone. Then the library gets a bill indicating that the price has jumped um, as much as 300%. How many of you librarians have seen that happen or have watched that? I know I have. Yeah. It's like, wham, 
And so then we come around to the faculty and say, so what are we going to do? Do we keep that journal? They say, yeah, because it's core. And so the market is bearing what, what, the, what the publishers were asking us to do. And so little journals keep getting cut out, and the, and the most popular journals keep going up, up, up in price. So that's why that 400,000, or excuse me, 400% increase has been happening, okay? And again, we saw this one last night, but it is a license to print money. But the, that, that business model is what's driving that ability. It's that driving out the little journal and keeping the core journal and raising its price to drive out the more little journals afterwards, okay? So, and this is not ending. This was published in the Library Journal's um, uh, serial survey last April, but the expectation is that prices will go up another 5 to 7% overall in fiscal 2015. Is Texas Women's University's budget going to go up 5 to 7%? Is the library budget going to go up 5 to 7 percent? No. Mine isn't either. Mine's pretty flat. Okay? So how am I going to manage that problem? What's going to happen at my institution if I want to maintain access to those things? Right? Right. <laughs> Cut. Right. Okay. So you remember this, this graph last night to show what's going on, that we've got, you know, profits here. And as Nick pointed out last night, this number is now closer to 40%, so it's exceeding Microsoft. And I guess Springer is now lagging behind Elsevier. Is that, is that right? Marginally. Marginally, <laughs> right. All I can say, I will say this, when I look at these, I don't know, you all don't, do you all participate in TIAA craft? Bro, do you do that now? Yes, yes you do. I really hope they have invested some money <laughs> in Elsevier because I really want some of it back. Anyway, um, so as I said, the problem is small society publications are getting eaten alive by the, the buyouts and the increases of the big of the big STM, primarily STM publications. And this is wiping out and gobbling up library budgets. It's really having a negative effect on us. And it's not sustainable, which is what the real issue is here. So here it is again. This is showing that for-profit journals, those published by those big for-profit pu um, publishers, are three times more expensive than those published by non-profit publishers. And in neuroscience, look at that, 890%. Anybody, do you all get brain research here? Do you know? No. <laughs> right. But it's always fun to look it up, isn't it? <laughs> it makes tetrahedron look kind of cheap. <laughs> So the question is, whenever I've talked to an econ economist about this, is they start looking at this and saying, well, wait a minute, where's the competition? There should be a way, you know, that's the way markets work. There's always competition. And then as you look at it and think about it, you realize that that's missing in this equation. It's a really anomalous situation. So think about it. Any article in any journal, think about even in like Time Magazine, um, if you needed to find it and you couldn't get that article, where could you go? What could you do? If you need that specific article, where, where do you go? Okay, well, but that's still that specific article. If you say this is an article on this particular topic and I need that article, can I go to a parallel journal and find something sort of like it? You know, each article is its own little monopoly. And so each journal is a monopoly. If I need brain research, I need brain research. I don't need studies in the brain because that will have different articles in it, right? So that's part of the problem. There is no competition. Okay, so um, thanks to Chris Reed, I have this cute little thing which is showing Texas women's expenditures for this six-year period. And um, this is important. Notice what's happening to the books and look what's happening to the journals. And I found after I looked at this that your budget and Trinity's budget are very similar in size. So I thought I'd show you a little bit longer period of time, but I would, I'd be willing to wager that your, your graph would look very much like this if you had the data. Um, back in the old days, I'm, I'm really going to date myself now, but how many people in here remember when the ideal library budget was a balance, 50% books, 50% journals? Right, I'm really dating myself here, but a couple. Okay. Look, Trinity didn't even hit that point until the early 90s. We were spending that much more on monographs at that time. We had a president that believed that um, 
the number of volumes was really going to uh, help us out in the U.S. News and World Report thing. <laughs> so apparently our budget for a while equaled that of the undergraduate library at Stanford University. So we have a good collection, don't we, Nick? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but so we didn't hit that, that sweet spot of 50% until the early 90s. But look what happened since then. Look at that, okay? So now it's about 20% of our overall expenditures, okay? So keep that in mind. Something important is happening in other ways there. Okay, so once again, I'm going to review some of this we've talked about already, but those of you who have published articles, um, when you do them, who's doing the work? Pardon? The author. Author's doing the work, okay. So who's paying you? Nobody. Well, you're, you're, you, you actually are working here, right? <laughs> well, is there something going on that we need to talk about? <laughs> Scratch this. Let's talk about paying people who work at Texas Women's University. Okay. But, okay, so Trinity, or sorry, Trinity, um, Texas Women's pays you, and the author does the work. Who's paying the publisher? Just <laughs> Okay, which is? Texas, Texas Women's University. University. Okay, so Texas Women's is paying these people and paying these people. And in the middle here, anybody in here a journal editor? Okay, who's paying you? The publisher. Huh? The publisher. The, uh, you are getting paid by the publisher. Well, no, it's for an editor. Okay, okay. You get paid. You get paid to edit your journal. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. You do. Okay. Do you make a lot? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, just check. Okay. All right. Anybody, any, so most of us are not getting paid. We're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts, right? Yeah. Oh. Don't get paid. All right. Peer review. Who does peer review in here? Okay. Big checks coming in on that one? No. Okay. So who's paying you to do peer review and editing for the most part, except for this one lucky man who's getting a little chump change for her? Okay. So Texas Women is paying for the work and for the publication. Okay, so that, that's kind of like bad math if you think about it, yeah. all right? So, okay, and you all saw this one last night, but I just, I, I'm actually going to dwell on it a little bit more where the guy apparently didn't quite get when he, when he talked to Jorge Cham what he was talking about. And so he says, you know, basically scientists give us their work for free, then we have volunteer scientists review it for free, then we bundle it up and sell it back to them out of profit, and he says it sounds outrageous, the scientists will do it because they want to be published. We can charge whatever we want is essentially a monopoly, and again, there's a the little guy there. So there it was, nature saying that, and um, I don't know if you've ever met anybody from the nature publishing group, but they always call it the nature family of publication. <laughs> They're so nice, it makes you feel so good. So anyway, that, but when, he, when his guard was down, he admitted that he's more like, like Mr. Moneybags there. Okay, so let's talk about why we do what we do. Those of you who do research, why do you do the research? I'm sorry, so you can publish, right? Okay, what was that? Tenure. Tenure, right, absolutely. Do you do it to, I mean, why did you go into doing research in higher education in the first place? Were you interested in something? Yeah. Okay. Huh? Fun. Fun. Right. <laughs> fun. Just lots of fun. Right. And, then, and did you want to share that? I mean, when you get a publication, it, yes, it's going to help you personally. Is it also because you want to share what you've learned or discovered or found? Yes. I'm sorry? Change practices. Yeah, change practices, do whatever. You want to have a positive influence, right? So that's why we publish our results. We put them out there because people want, or we hope people want to see what we've done. All right? So um, we touched on this. Thank you, Gretchen. I usually sort of wave a wand at this, but, you know, copyright is sort of laying in there as one of the issues or one of the headaches. Okay. Another thing to consider is that 80% of the research that's published out there is funded by us. us. Right. Okay. So tons of our own money is going straight into entities that then turn around and publish that research. All right. So we need a solution. We need something that deals with the needs of faculty and researchers in terms of building their resumes, um, coming up with, uh, get, er, you know, earning additional grants, gaining tenure, getting promoted, doing whatever, okay? Um, we need to retain peer review. One of the things I think that too often happens is somehow people believe that open access and peer review are separate issues, okay? Or in, in fact, they are separate issues. That 
peer review is, is its own thing. It can happen in all kinds of environments. And in an ideal world, we would increase the visibility and the findability of our work, right? I mean, the more people can find it and get access to it, the better. So obviously the solution and the competition is open access. And that is in the context of the kind of thing that Trinity has done. And it follows a lot on what Gretchen was talking about earlier about the statement already about work for hire. We too had a policy in place at Trinity that basically said that our work was owned by Trinity University. What we didn't have was a way to use that information as, as, as the beginning of a conversation with the publisher that had just accepted our work. Okay? And that's what our open access policy does. And ours is very much like Harvard's. You can find it on the web, you can find Harvard's. There are a number of them. But basically what it does is it, it requires the faculty member to take a moment and pause at that, at that little second there where they get their letter saying your, your article's been accepted for publication. It's like, wee, break out the champagne. Now, quick, sign this thing and sign away your rights to it and send it all right back right there. <coughs> and, um, and that, you know, who, who hasn't quickly turned that homework right back in? I mean, that's what we do, right? We're really happy. What we ask is that the faculty member go step down the hall for a minute, breathe, come back, and pull down our our little statement that basically says, I work for Trinity University and my employer requires that I retain my non-commercial rights with Trinity. The commercial rights are going to go to you, but the non-commercial rights are going to stay with me and then, or with Trinity actually. Again, so it's not even the person themselves holding onto it and having to fight this fight alone. It's saying my employer says I have to do this. So I can then deposit it under a Creative Commons license, like the CC BY that, that Nick was talking about last night, and put it in our institutional repository, where it can be, where, where it's scraped by Google Scholar and can then be located and used by people who don't have access to the paid subscription. So now we have the article in the paid subscription, and we have the article out on the IR, where it can be found in Google Scholar, and now there is another place to find that journal. There is competition there. And that has, I believe, started to put downward pressure on the price increases. In fact, Nick said he saw that tetrahedron had actually dropped price a little bit this year. Yay, for a couple thousand dollars, what, you know. But in fact, it, you know, as bad as the five to seven percent increases are, some of us remember when journal prices were jumping up 15% a year. And the fact that that has slowed, I think, is really attributable to this movement. I really do. And, um, and there's potential for other things to go on with that. Okay. So, um, again, this is the definition of it. Free, immediate, online access to scientific and scholarly articles with full reuse rights. And that's really critical. It's the idea that somebody else can reuse that content in an academic or scholarly or whatever setting as long as they attribute. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to the humanists. Again, where, where are the humanists in the room? Go on. Two. Just two? Okay, well, <laughs> you need to take this back to your colleagues, okay? <laughs> All right, so I want to go back and look at these numbers again. Um, see what's happening to the journal pricing. We're trying to level it off, but we're still fighting that, you see? Okay, so here is our book budget. What does this mean? for trying to get a book published. Do, has either of you published a book? Have you, have you tried lately? Hard. It's hard. It's really hard. Um, and we've seen, I, I watch for these articles and they're so depressing, but in the Chronicle of Higher Education about um, graduate institutions, or, or not grad, yeah, um, research institutions developing offices to help their young, early career humanists figure out a way to get a, a monograph published. And I, I have to tell a story that is now 10 years old, but 10 years ago, in November of 2014, the University of Texas, um, uh, their promotion and tenure committee, or whatever they call it there, for the College of Arts and Sciences, were starting to meet. And the night before, the library hosted a meeting. I don't know if anybody else was there, but they, they invited librarians from the area. And I, so I got to go with a couple of my colleagues. And they, um, they hosted a meeting just to talk about the state of scholarly publishing. And they invited 
people from some significant presses there. And the one that really, really caught my ear was the woman that was the acquisitions editor from Oxford University Press. She got up there in a room about this size, and the, the P&T people were sitting right in the middle here, you know. And she said to them, I want you to understand that my mission, my purpose, what I'm evaluated on is signing books that will sell. We are not there to evaluate the quality of the research. It could be fabulous, but if it's so narrow and so rarefied and so specialized that only 20 libraries will buy it, we will not sign it. And she said, you people need to stop using us to vet the quality of research. You need to stop thinking about the contract for the book to decide whether this person should be given tenure or not. And those people in the P&T Commission were, they were stunned because, of course, that's the easy way. Wow, they got a book with, you know, so-and-so press. It's a high prestige press. It's good. Well, you know, they were saying as this drops that the pressure is on them to only sign books that will be in this group where we will buy them in the library and to make sure that they're sold to enough libraries that it will actually turn a profit for them. Okay? So... This is, this issue here of journal pricing is absolutely an issue for the humanists too. And too often, the humanists want to say, it's just, you know, it's all about science, it's all about science. But it is, it is, I'm going to say our issue. I was, I was an English major, so I care deeply about good monographs, okay? So, let's say you're convinced now, but you say, well, what should we do? So, you can become institutions with an open access policy. And um, I, if you're interested in it, please do look at Trinity's. It does require really helping people understand what's going on. Um, there are There is a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I was really pleased last night that Sherry Lynn did not use the phrase predatory open access journals because, as Nick said, the predatory piece actually could apply to some subscription journals as well. The question is, are they high quality journals? Is that where you want to have your content there? Um, but the other issue is you can do what Trinity has done, which does not require that, that um, scholars seek open access venues, but only that they deposit their work in our IR and make it available that way. Okay, but this is this is a growing group. Um, I'm I'm trying to think. How, Nick, do you know how many members there are now in Kopi? I can tell you pretty quickly. That's okay. We'll, we'll go back to that. But but um, some of the institutions in it. So it's you know it's not just little guys like Trinity, but Arizona State, Columbia, Duke, Emory, my alma mater, Harvard, MIT, Penn State, Princeton, Purdue, Stanford, University of California System, um, University of Kansas, University of Texas System. University of Washington, Washington University of St. Louis, so a large and impressive group of institutions are in there. So um, it, to be in there, then we can, we can also sometimes speak as a group. So if you have a policy, you're part of COPE, and then you can participate in advocacy at the federal level or even at the state level if you want to do that. So, okay. So um, Nick touched on this pretty well last evening, but I just thought we'd just quick notice this. Um, again, I'm talking about FASTER, which he spoke about last evening. Um, we keep hoping that one of these days it will actually come up for a full vote and it will pass. It's got a really interesting group of participants. Um, Senator John Cornyn, who's a Trinity alum, that's where he did his undergraduate work, is a strong proponent. And um, he sees it as a, um, as like a homeland security issue. But I think he also sees it as a taxpayer rights issue. If we pay for the research, we don't have access to it. Um, so it's pretty interesting. But the detractors include big publishing. And sort of picking up on what Gretchen talked about, big publishing, big for-profit publishing, has absolutely gotten in bed with the entertainment industry. And so when Disney is worrying about what happens when the copyright runs out on Mickey Mouse, and, say, and says, let's extend copyright another 20 years, big publishing is right in there with them. And I really feel that we're at risk of losing, I mean, in effect, losing the public domain. Because each time we extend out that copyright, it's that much longer before it's in the public domain. So again, back to open access, it eliminates that question. The, the commercial stuff's still in that, in that area, but in terms of what you've licensed and what you've put out there, it's out there right now. 
Um, I do want to mention the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resource Coalition, SPARC. Um, it, uh, I did serve on the steering committee of this group uh, in the late, oh, how do you say that? I don't know. 2000. Yeah, the late 2000s. Thank you. Um, and it was really one of the most valuable professional experiences I've ever had because it was right in there working with Heather Joseph, who is Nick's boss, and, and looking at what do we need to do to sort of drive this question both in sort of in the higher ed um, policy sphere, in the federal policy sphere, you know, how do we get those conversations started? And I was really proud to be part of it. It's a really distinguished and significant organization. And um, if you are not members, you ought to think about signing up because then you can get Nick to come visit you for free. <laughs> Although we use the alumni thing, but still, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And here are some of their here are some of their uh, partners. And again, one of the ones that's really interesting is the Alliance for Taxpayer Access, which is a group that generally argues that anybody who's paid their taxes should at minimum have easy access to medical information. And if you want to get your heartstrings plucked, look at some of the stories on there about people who have had a family member or another loved one diagnosed with a difficult illness and the desperate need to get to information about it and what happens when they run into a paywall. I mean, talk about the open access button. That's when you really want to hit it. Um, and again, this is Nick's area, and he is the founder of the Right to Research Coalition, so um, we're very proud of what he's done with that thing. So pretty, pretty distinguished group of folks. Okay, when he talked about the open access button last night, I think it is the coolest possible thing. <laughs> and I love the way the little map keeps changing as people run into the button. Okay, so now has anybody run into this thing? Do you know what I'm talking about? The disembargo? Okay, I'm, maybe I should be glad there are no historians in here. But um, the, uh, the issue with disembargo is, you know, there, there have been, uh, the American Historical Association has been sort of anti-open access, and they have worried about the question of how can a historian get his or her dissertation republished as a monograph if it's made available immediately in an electronic thesis and dissertation site. Um, and so they argued for lengthy embargoes. And this person has responded. Let's see. Whoop. Hang on. Let me see if I can go back and see this. Hang on. I've got to show this thing to you because it's so cool. <laughs> okay. Here it is. Okay, this is his uh, disembargo. He's making his dissertation open one letter at a time. The mail guy. <laughs> you can fix it. It's not showing. Oh, it's not showing? Oh, right. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> there we go. There it is. Okay. All right. And if you scan down, let's see. How do I, how do, I get to do this? If you scan down on the thing, there it is. This is chunking along. It's one letter at a time. And uh, when I looked at it the other day, it was around, I don't know, it was someplace in here around Buckeye Steel Casting Company. But it, if you sit and watch it, another letter goes up. But he's doing this. See, the disembargal period ends in five years, four months, 28 days, and he's got the amount of time. But his point is, holding it back is really pretty silly. If it has value and it needs to be out there, keeping it away from everyone is probably not the right response. And he's calling on historians to think very differently about this question and invite them to think not about opposing open access, but thinking about what does it mean to publish a monograph and how do we share our research and evaluate it in meaningful ways that may not be in the traditional publishing process. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Okay. And then, let's see, now i got to go back here. <coughs> Sorry. Let's see what happens when I hit this. Okay, thank you. Play. There we go. Okay, so we talked about open access week. Are you all planning things? Doing things here? You can always get cool swag. I mean, you already are way down the road because you have good buttons going on. But there's a lot of stuff going on. Right, yeah. Okay, and then last night we talked about Jack and Draco. Um, which I think is incredibly cool. One thing that Nick didn't say about him last night that I want to share is um, he did use a lot of information that he got through PubMed Central, but his parents were well-to-do and willing to drop about $1,200 a month on pay-per-view articles for him. So think about that. I mean, those of you who have children that have done science projects, are you willing to do that? You know, um, I was not. <laughs> um, and I did have to get some things from my library for my kid over the years, but in fact, their parent, the, the, the issue is his parents did have to shell out that kind of money, and then that automatically privileges the better off kid. 
you know, puts him in sort of the 1% of students, not just intellectually, but financially as well. I think they probably knew they had an exceptionally smart kid on their hands, but still, that's a lot of money. Okay, so these are some things he said. Um, you referred to this last night, Nick, but these are some things he said, you know, just because in most online databases, articles cost about $35 and they're only about 10 pages. I love that. It's like, that's not fair. You know, and then he says this, you know, my research should serve as a testament to free online research. It was hard to get what I needed without the costs. And I remember one time talking to Nick about Jack, and um, your, your comment was that he actually said he knew about 40 other kids that were a lot like him that could be doing this kind of work if they had the kind of access that, that you need. So think about the lost opportunity we have when we assume that the only people who can use scholarly research are other scholars. And that's an argument I've heard, and I, I think it's really kind of a pessimistic view of the human intellect when we think that way. So, I'd like to conclude with humor, and let's see if I can make this thing go. Let's see. Here we go again. I can't get my, how do I get my cursor over there? I am so sorry. There it is. Time means publisher up the top. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, sound. Script has been accepted by the journal I own. Just sign here. What is this? It grants you the copyright to my manuscript. Yes. I'm a for-profit publisher, and this is my copyright form. Sign here. Why do you need the copyright to my article? So no one else can publish it. Sign here. Could we just put all the articles on the internet for anyone to download for free? No. I want universities and others to pay me for your article. How much is my royalty share? Your royalty share will be 0%. Okay, I want a flat payment to me of $500. How about zero? <laughs> How much money will the researchers get who reviewed my article? They will get zero. Taxpayers paid for my research. Then other researchers donated their time to assess my article. Now if I give you the copyright, you must be paid dozens of dollars per article, or thousands for a library subscription? Yes, that is correct. Sign here. How much profit will you make from my article? Our expenses are low. Our operating profit margin is over 30%. Thank you for your work. Thank you to the reviewers. Thank you. Sign here. Do you want to my student funded and government funded research to be left behind paywalls? I am a publisher, not an ethicist. Please give me the copyright to your article. I will sell it many times, and I will buy a house on the beach. You said you already have a house on the beach. Yes. I like to buy houses on the beach. Sign here. There is an alternative to you called Open Access Journals. All articles in them are free to download. Open access journals are a dangerous threat to our venerable journal system. Okay, give me $1,500 and I will make your specific article free. What about all the other articles in the journal? Don't worry, they will not be free. Some libraries still will have to pay for a subscription. My operating profit margin will remain high. If I publish in an open access journal, I will be helping make lots of articles free. If I deposit the final draft of articles in my university's digital repository, anyone can download them and that will reduce your ability to charge large subscription fees. Sign here. <laughs> Stop that one, okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Use one last presentation. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, at this point, we can. I think we can open up for questions. Um, 
I did want to make, a, just before, right before we do, I want to make a couple of comments, and that is, um, I do think one of the risks we run when we talk about these things is to overly focus on the sciences. And, and initially, that was the focus, and that's where a lot of the public um, funding for research goes. And it's easy to sort of pull back and say, well, it really is a science issue. It's not a humanities issue. It's not a, even a social sciences issue. My personal view is that we, we, are, we run a great risk at that point of further marginalizing the humanities. One of the concerns that I think we, that more and more we're, ha we're hearing about is this idea that there's so much more value placed on the STEM fields than on other fields that, you know, we're starting to lose the value of the liberal arts. And I would assume that you still value them here as we do at Trinity. And so I feel like it's really, really important for those of us who are outside of the sciences to also understand what these issues are and become able to discuss them and support them and understand why it's important for us all to participate in changing a system that is no longer sustainable. And that's the real issue here is sustainability. <laughs>